God understands your familial struggles because he created the world in this way from the very beginning. Don't worry about experiencing strife. God made you go through that on purpose. God wanted us all to suffer. Okay. Hello, lovely people. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Emma. Welcome if you are new. Today I will be reviewing the faith portion of Classically Abby's first ever podcast episode. Last time I tackled the first section of her podcast, a little bit of the introduction and her explanation as to why her judgmental behaviour is not actually judgmental. And it got very frustrating. All women except Abby are wrong about what will actually make them happy. The usual stuff. That was quite long on its own, and since her podcast is broken into different sections, I thought we would tackle the faith portion separately, so that's what we're doing today. If you're interested in how I put together this glamorous yet modest look, there is a video on Emma Thorne Extra where I followed Classically Abby's guide on looking modest but hot, and uh, I came up with a few outfits. This is the one I chose, so if you don't like it, blame Abby, not me. Without further ado, let me grab... My headphones. Without further ado, let us crack on with the podcast. I'm going to sneeze. So our faith talk for today is going to be around the Torah portion, which is called in English, He Lived. In Hebrew, it's Parshat Vayechi. Uh, this is the last Parsha of Bereshit, of Genesis. I personally love Genesis. I love our forefathers. I love Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I love our four mothers. I love... Can't name any of the four mothers. Of course she loves Genesis. If you're not aware, Genesis is also one of my favourite, but probably for very different reasons. Some of the stories are fun, yes. Some of the stories are horrifying. It's deeply unscientific. It clashes with reality. God's behaviour in Genesis is often very funny, as well as quite horrific. There's a lot of fun to be had with Genesis. Bits of it are quite incredibly boring as well. I'm intrigued. Of course it's Genesis. That's just so fun. I'm intrigued to see what Abby has to say about this. All of the stories, because the characters and the people in the Bible are just so real. Nobody's perfect. They are all real human beings who make real mistakes. Like, like owning slaves. Like owning and trading slaves. You know, like little mistakes like that who deal with real tragedies and real struggles, just like we do, they're there for us to learn lessons. They're not supposed to be people that we look up to and say like, well, they were perfect and I'll never reach that. We're supposed to look up to our to our ancestors, to the people who created our faith, who, who were there at the beginning and, and everything, to see how we can learn from them and grow. So in this Parsha, in this Torah portion, Jacob is dying. And he calls Joseph to him and he has him bring Manasseh and Ephraim, Ephraim, Manasseh and Ephraim in Hebrew. Uh, and he gives them a blessing. But if you remember, he crosses his hands or at least puts his right hand on the younger sibling and his left hand on the older sibling. So he gives the firstborn blessing to the younger sibling, which is a repeat of what happened with him, where... Isaac put, gave the younger brother, Jacob, the firstborn blessing. I don't know if this was the case in the first... Sorry to interrupt. I don't know if this was the case in the first half. It must have been. There's a weird like background noise when she talks. Maybe I had it quieter last time? Every time she speaks, there's like a kind of humming sound. I don't know if it's a vibration or... Sorry about that. I just didn't notice it before. I don't know where that's coming from. That happens... Um, he kind of gives his the 12 tribes their, their stories of like what's going to happen to them and, and what, they're, what they hold, what their futures hold. The fun thing about this story, if you remember, what actually happened with Jacob is that he and his mother conspired to deceive uh, his father. His father was old and dying and, you know, didn't have great eyesight, so he and his mum kind of dressed him up to look like Esau, and he stole that birthright blessing by deception. And he's kind of, like, honouring that deception now by, again, passing the, the, the firstborn birthright onto his youngest son. I just think that's kind of interesting, is, like, a, I, I suppose... I suppose Abby said that these aren't perfect people, these are people whose mistakes we learn from, but he doesn't really get punished for that <laughs> deception. They are kind of told, and Rebecca's told, I believe, uh, that 
you know the the older will serve the younger or whatever so it's kind of it, it, it's sort of ordained that the younger one will get the blessing anyway i just i just find that whole thing kind of weird <laughs> it's a really weird bit of story so following that jacob dies he's brought to israel to be buried and to canaan at the time and the uh brothers come to joseph and they say please forgive us for what we did please don't hold it against us if you remember the brothers sold Joseph basically into slavery, and then he ended up rising the ranks in Egypt. And yeah, it's a big... Um, the Bible does say that it was wrong of them to sell Joseph into slavery. However, you can really read this part of the Torah as a kind of pro-slavery propaganda. Joseph's slavery is, like, kind of fine and despite being a slave, he rises up the ranks to be besties with the pharaoh. It's, again, it's kind of bizarre. You can take it in different ways, but I find some of the morals to be a little bit ambiguous, bordering on not very healthy, personally. And Joseph says, of course I'll forgive you, and then Joseph himself dies, uh, and that's the end of the first book of the Torah. What's so interesting about the Torah and Genesis is the sibling, the sibling rivalries, the marriages, the relationships with the children and between them. We see so much family strife, right? We've got Esau and, and Isaac. We've got Jacob and, um, and then his story with Rachel and Leah, right? That's the, the marriages that he has to deal with. And then Bilhah and Zilpah as well. They're, they're handmaids. Let's talk about, Abby's been a little bit vague, let's talk about the marriages that he had to deal with. So so the, the marriages that Jacob had to deal with. Okay, so when uh, Jacob was 77, when he was 77 years old, he met the young, beautiful Rachel. And remember, this is fine, because in those days they lived to like 150 years old, so it's okay for a 77-year-old to fall in love with this really young woman, who is also his cousin in case that matters to anyone. He falls in love with her, he asks her father for her hand because women don't have choices, and he basically offers to work for seven years for her dad, whatever, he goes through the seven years, um, and then he's like, right, it's time to marry beautiful young Rachel. Uh, he's now 84. Laban, the wife of... the wife? Laban, the father of uh, Rachel and, and Leah, deceives him by swapping Rachel... <laughs> Such a bizarre... They really are fun stories because they're so bizarre. Looking at them for guidance is very bizarre. The the people that do things that we would now consider sort of wrong in Genesis aren't really criticised. They aren't... They don't really suffer consequences very often. It's more sort of, this is just what happened and, and quite often these people who do these bad things or things that certainly seem to me to be really bad are like God's blessed chosen ones, you know? So he switches out Rachel. She's wearing a veil, so they can't tell, whatever. It's revealed and he kind of says, well, it's, you know, it's it's not the done thing to to give away a younger daughter before an older one, you know? I gotta, sh she's getting on, you know? I gotta get rid of her before it's too late. In the end, they strike a new deal. Jacob works for another seven years and uh, he gets to marry both sisters. So they've got this kind of incestuous, polygamous relationship and everything's great. Except it's not really great because, of course, this kind of relationship that the women don't really have any say in is not great. Leah knows that Jacob loves Rachel more than her and feels, like, dejected and left out, obviously. She's sharing a family with her sister. It's just... For some reason, God is involved in the having of all children at this point in the Bible. I don't know at what point he gave that up, or if it was only special people that he focused on when they should have children, but he gives uh, Leah a bunch of children really quickly, and Rachel is barren. So Rachel gives her handmaid, which is more trading of slaves, she gives her handmaid to Jacob, to have her children for her because that's just something they did back then it's fine you could use you could use this slave woman as just a, a womb to borrow apparently in those days it was fucking fine this story presented as a tale of 
horrible, unethical choices would be completely fine with me. It's weird for it to be presented in, like, a positive light. Then Leah gives her handmaiden to Jacob. <sighs> more womb trading. So that she can have more kids through her. Then Leah has more kids. Then God remembers Rachel. That's what happens. He remembers her. And she has a couple more kids. And that's the family. Fucking weirdest family dynamics. Can you imagine the dinner table? It's bizarre. Then there's some nonsense with some sheep. Laban basically doesn't want to let Jacob go because he's been a real boon to him because Jacob is this blessed chosen descendant because he's one of God's favourite, random favourite people. Which is another thing that I find really morally questionable, but that's an aside. So Laban is sort of deceiving him, but then uh, Jacob succeeds with God's blessing. God's like, I've seen this guy is like trying to mess with you and you're one of my boys, so I'm not letting that happen. So God gives him more blessings and whatever, he, he, he gets let go. God tells Jacob to go back to where he was born and so they set off. He has a bit of a chase thing with Laban, but God intervenes again and it's fine. Esau comes back, looks like they're going to fight, but they reconcile. Uh, Jacob changes his name to Israel, Rachel dies having another baby, Isaac finally dies when he's 180. Then we have Joseph and his magical dreams. I just wanted to give an over... I'm, I'm just assuming that everybody knows that part better. If Abby goes into it more, then I'll, I'll provide any details we need. I just wanted to kind of give an overview of that first half because it's so uncool <laughs> in so many ways. There are definitely some lessons to learn there. The... the I see what Abby means when you think of, like, uh, the brothers in their righteous anger trying to defend their sister, but then their father's saying, this is too much, you know, the the, the bloodshed, and, like, what are you doing? There's some lessons, I, I feel like they should be pretty obvious lessons, but there's some lessons to be learned there for sure. But in general, the sort of underlying society that it uh, not just tolerates, but, you know, is is just normal because it's a it's a piece of history and god isn't real uh it, it's really not a very ethical one at all but that's not something that i guess bothers abby i don't know let's let's carry on right that's the the marriages that he has to deal with and then bilha and zilpa as well they're they're handmaids we have slaves you know Ishma they're handmaids but they get repeatedly given to people to breed for them. <laughs> so, I mean, they're slaves. They basically are treated as just wombs for hire, uh, but they're not hired, they're just given. So, slaves. But what's so interesting about it is that so much of the story of the Torah shows family strife and that it's simply built into the structure of the world. The way that these families, even from the very beginning, are built, are built to have these, these family struggles. Which kind of begs the question, why? <laughs> yes, man fell, but even when we were perfect, uh, if you go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis, when, uh, when God created the first people, Adam and Eve, it was Eve convincing Adam to do something that he shouldn't do, you know, um, I've talked about the ethics of that in general and God's buying that a million times, so we'll ignore that. But it's, you know, it's sort of relationship strife even back when they were like, perfect immortal beings. It, why would God design, and this is kind of what Abby is sort of saying here, why would God design families to have strife and struggles? Isn't that really counterintuitive to family being this most important, valuable thing? Why would his chosen people keep betraying each other in all these ways and i and not being condemned by him they're, they're like his absolute even when they do betray their family members they're his most special precious favoritist boys it boggles the mind a little bit doesn't it i feel like and i don't want to be this is her first ever podcast episode and quite often i stumble over my words and there's a reason that i don't stream so much unless i have a, an activity like a game to play or something i feel like abby is struggling much more here than she was in the earlier section and i wonder if that's just because she doesn't talk about faith as much on her channel these days there's a lot of 
pausing and then sort of repeating herself and oh no it's that excuse me ha huh. excuse me and i'm finding it really awkward to try and listen to i don't blame her it's a new format and she wants to try it out that's perfectly fine but this is definitely not coming across anywhere near as as confident or or meaningful so far as the first half siblings are are not getting along younger children get firstborn rights uh, marriages are not going smoothly, and un and people are allowed to marry multiple people. Are we going to talk about that? Because that's a thing here. Polygamy is clearly perfectly fine, and again, these are God's chosen people. He doesn't have anything to say about the fact that they marry multiple women and then have children with the servants or slaves of their wives, and that's... Isn't that having children out of wedlock? No. No, because <laughs> those handmaids are seen as the property of the wives and therefore it's the wives children which is bizarre because they are having sex out of wedlock there's essentially there's essentially four women in that relationship in the end married to this one man and none of the women had any say in the matter some of them it was the other women that were dragging them in some of them it was you know their father that so much of that is so wrong and god has has nothing to say about it and so much of that is contrary to Abby's modern beliefs. How come her husband doesn't have, you know, a couple of other wives? Why doesn't she have a slave that she can give to him if she's not in the mood to have more children right now? Uncle relationships don't work out well either. There's quite a bit of struggle that's built into and baked into the Torah. And as people who are traditional and who look to marriage as such an important part of our lives... We might think when things are stressful between spouses or when things are stressful within families, you know, parent to, to child, that we're doing something wrong or that we're failing or that this isn't a godly, a godly way of approaching our, our families. If you look to the Torah, you'll see that that's not the case. If you're struggling with that, it doesn't make you a worse Christian or a worse Jew. It's so interesting, and this is something that I've always found fascinating about Abby, that she tends to put, and I wonder if it's deliberate because of her audience or if it's sort of subtle, she doesn't notice she's doing it. She's going to tap on my face to make sure I am the one in focus in this video. <laughs> she puts Christian before Jew. She puts the Bible before the Torah, just naturally in her language. And I think it's so fascinating, and part of why I wanted to hear her, her thoughts on faith, and unfortunately she's kind of gone around in circles saying like one sentence, which is that there are family struggles in the Torah, which, yeah. And uh, her statement here about how, you know, if you're a traditional person and you feel like you're failing, look at the Torah, here's examples of family strife. That's quite nice, that's fair enough as a sort of teaching point, but that's kind of all she's said, and it's been quite a long time now. I think it's so interesting that her kind of views do seem to align and I get a lot of when I've talked about her before I've seen this in the comments where people have mistaken her for Christian or more orthodox Christian rather than Jewish because her views seem to align more with modern American Christianity despite having grown up quite orthodox some of her some of her views on things like say abortion are contradictory to mainstream Judaism and more in line with mainstream Christianity in the US right now. I just find that so interesting and I wonder if she would agree with that or or if, you know, that's just based on what she presents on the internet or if I'm just like totally off base. I just find the whole thing quite fascinating. It just means you are going through the same things our forefathers did and you also have to navigate it. And luckily you have a blueprint for kind of how to do it or what not to do. If only the Bible uh, the and the Torah made it clear what was not to do and what was to do. Because there's... Because again, God's chosen people who are praised and rewarded and loved do some terrible things in this text, including in the book that Abby's talking about. And it's often not presented as the what not to do. In that story, it doesn't say you shouldn't marry two people and have sex with their, well, sexually abuse their 
slaves. It doesn't it doesn't say any of that. The people in the Torah are just that. They're just people. They aren't any more than we are or any less. Now, of course, in some ways they are more, but they're also just humans. And yet we learn from them and look up to them because they did amazing things despite also going through trials and tribulations and making mistakes. It's important for us to know that God understands your familial struggles because he created the world in this way from the very beginning. So she really does believe, she doesn't think that it's part of the fall. She thinks that family strife is just a part of God's plan. Why? (laughs) Why would an all-powerful God build strife into the world? It's a test. It's just a way to, you know, struggles make you stronger. These are the kinds of things that I hear from religious people attempting to justify this. And that doesn't really work for the model of God that you're trying to convince me is real. Very bizarre. Very bizarre. Don't worry about experiencing strife. God made you go through that on purpose. God wanted us all to suffer. Okay. Cool. (laughs) Families are not supposed to be perfect. I thought he made everything perfect. I thought everything was perfect. God was perfect. He made everything perfect. And then the fall happened. I didn't realize that God made some things not perfect, like the family. That sounds contradictory to things I've heard in the past. We can strive for goodness. We can strive for perfection, and I put that in quotes. But even from the very beginning, that wasn't wasn't the way things were built. People don't always get along. People don't always make the choices we would hope they would. And that is part of being alive is navigating these relationships that are so absolutely important. If this is also truly very important, and I think, obviously from a very different perspective, I think that important relationships to you are worth working on and cherishing, and they are very important and valuable. But if it was all so important, and the Torah or the Bible exists to show you what to do and what not to do and provide examples... Why wouldn't God make it clearer what is a good thing and what is a bad thing? Why do we have scholarly debates today? Why do I see people in comment sections of anything to do with religion defending biblical slavery and arguing over that and debating over things like that? Why is it so ambiguous? Why is it so up to interpretation? If it's so important, God should have laid it out real clearly. Why would he be vague? about such important ethical choices. Slavery. (laughs) Marriage, if marriage is supposed to be the be-all and end-all, and having children, and how you're supposed to treat them. It's just bizarre. It doesn't... It doesn't make sense to view the text in that way. But it doesn't make it worse. It doesn't make you a bad person to have those struggles in your life. It just makes you of the way that God created the world. (laughs) So you're not alone. And I don't even mean from the sense of you're not alone because there are other people you know who are going through it. I mean it in the sense of you are not alone because God built this in, like he baked it into our world. He baked it into the way things work. I I feel like it's been like 10 minutes of my life and all we've said over and over again in different ways with lots of pauses is, there's family strife and God did that on purpose and I appreciate the reassuring statements and that's probably a nice thing to hear if you share Abby's values and beliefs but it doesn't really I feel like we could have covered this in about 20 seconds and it's like I'm looking at my watch like (laughs) are we gonna get into anything else are we gonna talk about anything a bit more specifically because my word is this vague so it's up to us to work through that but it's also up to us to understand that It's okay when we're going through it. That is it for... So, just again, with regards to the podcast technicalities, and she's done another one, so maybe she's already fixed this by now. It's also, I noticed, cutting out the start of her words quite often. It's like maybe um, what's going on with the humming is that there was a constant hum and then there's been some noise cancellation between her talking and it's been like too heavy so it's cutting off sort of the starts of her speech or something and it's only noticeable because there are these big pauses. That might be it. That's it. That's it. That's it. We're going to talk about... (laughs) 
her first podcast episode. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. It's her first ever podcast episode where she's going to regularly do a, a faith or Torah-based section. She started with the last part of the Torah, the last book. She said basically nothing. I hope this isn't too disappointing for everyone. It's kind of disappointing for me. She said basically nothing, except that family struggles exist in the Torah and therefore don't feel bad about them if they exist in real life. And that is basically the entire portion that we wrapped up in, what, 15, 20 seconds there. She didn't really get into the content of that book beyond, you know, there were marriages that Jacob struggled with and stuff like that. I found that section very bizarre. It was clear that Abby struggled with that a lot more than she did the how to be a conservative traditional lady part, which is so fascinating. I'd love to know, especially from anyone who is a religious Jew, how much Abby's kind of view and discussions on this topic are in line with most people, because it feels weird to me. I don't know, just something about this. I, I, it might just be a lack of confidence in talking about this topic, which is completely fair and understandable. And the message that she was giving was perfectly nice, was very nice. It was, don't worry about your struggles, this is normal. find it very weird that apparently God baked family struggles into the world. He designed it that way on purpose, and we're not given any explanation or, or opinion as to why. That I, I found that whole thing very lacking, to be honest. But at least it was nice, where the first part was so utterly infuriating. So I guess that was kind of a palate cleanser. <laughs> there we go. That's Classically Abby's new podcast. I, um, I'm happy to leave her to it unless something particularly juicy comes up that people want me to react to. I'm happy to let her go on with the podcast now. We know what it is. We know what kind of things she's going to cover. She, she, she can go on. Let's leave her to it <laughs> and move on with our lives. Thank you so much for watching. Do leave your thoughts down below. Do give this video a cheeky like. Do please consider subscribing if you haven't already. As I mentioned earlier, I have another channel, Emma Thorne Extra, where I do behind the scenes things. Like I said, you can see me trying on modest outfits for this video. It's quite silly, but it's a lot of fun. I also have a gaming channel at Little Duck Gaming, where I play lots of different kinds of games and play an escape sim with a buddy at the moment. I've got a Minecraft series going on, play some spoopy horror games, all kinds of things. Do I use social media too much? Nah. I also have a Twitch where I am live on average three times a week. We have a lot of viewer participation. We can have a chat in that one. It's really fun. We've got a nice little community over there. And finally, I must give a big thank you to my supporters over on Patreon. This all this whole shebang would not be possible without you, so thank you so much for all your support. With that, I must give an extra big shout out and a thank you to my colossal quackers and giant chickens over on Patreon. <laughs>